There he is. Hi. How are you, friend? I'm good. How are you? I'm, you know, getting my coffee ready. Just put a little creamer in it because it's a coffee chat. How are you doing? Good. I got mine. I'm ready to go. Oh, we're ready to go. So let's let's talk about stuff and things. I mean, obviously, we're all stuck in our own houses. So gonna, how do you stay busy wait. in your house? Do you have like a whole studio to play drums on all the time? Not actual acoustic drums, which is unfortunate. What? But, oh, I know. Neighbors would line up to my at my door to kill me if I played drums in this room. I guarantee it. <laughs> but how uh, close are your neighbors? Do you have like paper thin walls? I don't, but I play quite loudly, as you've seen. Mm. And drums are just loud in general. You can't really yeah. get around. So is this one of those moments where you wish that you had gotten a garage when you bought your first place? I do have a garage. It's just <laughs> it just is too loud for the garage, too? Yeah, well, the, the garage makes it louder, actually, because the sound travels, it bounces off walls. It's chaos. This would be the moment to take all of your hoodies from past tours, mm -hmm. take some masking tape and or electrical tape, pad the walls of your garage, and yeah. just go crazy. I didn't know you were an expert soundproofer. That's that's a good idea. I'm basically MacGyver. Welcome yeah. to the MacGyver session with Christy Taylor and coffee. Yeah. Are your eyes okay? I wonder if they're being poked. They are by my bangs. Thank you for noticing. I need a haircut. But they, oh, <laughs> it's hard to come by in quarantine. Your hair's getting long too. I've neglected to get my hair cut for far too long now, and now I don't have a choice. I just can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how long have you been locked down in California now? Um, I don't know when the official lockdown was, but the the touring I was doing ground to a halt probably, I don't know, around the 15th or 16th of March, maybe? Mm -hmm. Unless I'm completely getting it right. So, time blur, for so people don't that don't know you as well as I do, you were on tour with Silver Sun Pickups, correct? We were supposed to see you, too. I know. we. You were like a week out from being here. You were playing First Avenue, right? Right, which is the and, last well. And then, yeah, it didn't happen. Yeah, really unfortunate. I hope that uh, the dates get made up. I, I just, I, I have a hard time with believing or committing to anything schedule-wise because nobody really knows mm -hmm. what, now it seems silly to say, yeah, we'll be there in a couple months when who knows where we're going to be. I mean, hopefully that would be amazing, but. I mean, are you hopeful, though, from what you hear as being an industry insider with connections to a band who's, I don't know, getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year, like, no big deal, to obviously bands that are up and coming, like, I think we can say the new regime is at this point, like, you have multiple levels of access to information musically. Hmm. Do you feel that there'll be more of an opportunity to play small shows and it'll just be arena shows that might get pushed off? Or do you feel it's going to be all shows in general? I really don't know, and mm -hmm. trying to be vague with, with an answer. <laughs> the thing that is difficult, and I will say, is that you got to think that everybody who had announced shows are now fighting for the same venues in the same narrow window to make all of them up. Mm -hmm. And you also have to think there are a ton of bands who hadn't even gotten to announcing because let's say you play, let's say you do a winter tour towards the end of the year. Yeah. Some people just announce that stuff a couple or a few months before, not necessarily at the, at the top of the year. Mm -hmm. So I think once we hopefully get over that hurdle somewhat smoothly where all the shows are then made up, I think only then will things start to smooth out and kind of get back on track. But mm -hmm. it's, with all of the things that you mentioned that I'm fortunate enough to be a part of, I mean, everything was affected in one way or another. I mean, you mentioned the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That was something that was swept aside and has been postponed. So to... you're not even going to get to, you guys were going to play, weren't you? Yeah, I'd met. yes. But um, it was postponed. I just don't recall what the date was. That's wild. <laughs> I'll check the Did email. they ever figure out a way to get you included into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction? as the newer member of the band? The way the, the politics work, I have no idea. Well, it's funny you say new, it's been 11 years now, which I- <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when you joined Nine Inch Nails? Can I ask that? I was 20. 20. Yeah. That is wild. So you started touring, what was it, like Warp Tour and stuff when you were what, 12? 
Yeah, I mean, my, my first stint on Warp Tour, I was before that. I mean, the first show I ever played at a Warp Tour was 99. Um, so it would have been, yeah. Who 11. were you playing with then? Oh, just n nothing. Just, you know, first bands sort of situation, things that most yeah, people sure, sure. like you keep bringing up. I just think it's cool that you hate when I say this. He I do. It's when I say this, but you're a child prodigy. I mean, you're not a child anymore, but you are a child prodigy back <laughs> when you were a child. I suppose. Well, thank you. How many instruments do you actually play? Oh, I mean, four that I play well. And those are, aside from drums. Okay, well, we've got to count that. I mean, mm -hmm. started, and that's where most people would know me from, but drums, bass, guitar, I've spent well over 10 years um, on guitar and bass, almost 20 years playing, but, but yeah. Well, which one's the hardest to play? I, I mean, everything should be difficult to a degree or else you're not challenging yourself enough, right? You love to challenge yourself. So which one challenges you the most? They challenge me in different ways, you know? And, but here's what becomes tough is that um, with all the instruments that I play, I obviously apply them to songwriting. And difficulty of instrumentation doesn't usually lend itself to pleasant music, unless right. you like classical music, which is fantastic. And that is a way I do love to challenge myself because those things can be very challenging and they are very challenging. But there comes that time where I could be practicing something and I figure, you know what? my time would probably be better spent doing something I can apply to a song. Yeah. I mean, for me, nobody's ever going to hear this, but yeah. I can learn some other chords or something that isn't necessarily difficult or challenging, but it's more conducive to helping me write better music. Well, you're really talented in so many ways at music. What Thanks. drums was where it started for you, but was that the first instrument you started playing as a kid? Yeah. First Who taught you how to play. My dad got me started. Uh, he was a drummer when he was in, you know, middle school, high school. He did the respectable thing and, you know, got a job and his master's degree. And fortunately, he kept his drums and set him up in the garage for his sons. So I have two older brothers, as you know. I'm the youngest mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. But I already started playing music and experimenting with the drums. So I either found it interesting or thought I could do it as well and I started playing but my dad recognized that I had a natural rhythm to it and I wasn't just hitting stuff and making noise so he got me started and taught me my first few beats and I mean, he taught me more than that but when I realized how the drums worked in the sense of I know how to play a beat I know how to make up my own beats I know how yeah. to learn by listening to songs yeah I just I took off running and uh, the obsession never left me in terms of music in general. I mean, I mean my, my obsessions kind of shift. And so from seven and a half, eight years old to about 12, I did nothing but play drums. But then I picked up the guitar, which yeah. my gravitated towards after I picked up the drums. Right. The guitar, and it was the exact same thing over and over and over again. I learned a couple of things. And then when I figured out how to teach myself or how to learn, I, I took off with it. Do you know, you probably do, but did you know that they say people who are drummers use more of their brains than any other type of human out there on the planet? They... I don't know how that's possible, to be I honest. I mean, isn't it that same thing? Like, you could obviously pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time, and a lot of other people would have to think about that. Yeah, but let's also think about how far that skill really gets us. I don't know. They just say that you're using more of your brain, so kudos to you. I mean... For people out there trying to get their kids started in music, I know I hear a variety of different, you can't start them too early or you can't start them too late. Would you say when you started like six, seven years old is the perfect time for anyone who has kids and wants them to start playing drums or guitar? It's really, it really depends on the person, you know, and I haven't spent a lot of time with seven, eight year olds. Really? But, yeah, not really, <laughs> but I mean, when I have a kid, I'd obviously like to get them started, but I would really go the cliche route of the piano. I think it's the greatest instrument of all time solely because, I mean, not solely, there's so many reasons, but 
it's the instrument where you can do the most at one time. I mean, you have the entire range of the, the entire musical range right in front of you on a keyboard. Yeah. You're able to play bass, melody, harmony, all of these things at once. It's rhythmic. And you can accomplish everything with it. The thing is, is that a lot of kids, when they are forced to play piano, and a lot of the time they are forced by their parents, right. don't appreciate it. And that then ruins it for them. And I do think that my parents and my dad in particular didn't really want to force me too much. But when I got to an age, uh, but then I, I got to an age where I just wanted to do it. And when you yeah. want something, that's when you accomplish the most and, and get farthest. Yeah, I you're think. definitely passionate about it to the point that you obviously were out touring by the time you were 11, 12 years old, which means, did mm. you actually do get pulled out of school and do homeschooling or schooling on the road while you were touring when you were a kid? I did. I mean, not that early. I was able to go through about just shy of my second semester of sophomore year. But at so that point- for we're everyone that's at home doing that schooling now, what are your pro tips to get through it? Because you've actually done schooling away from school before. Oh, that's tough. School <laughs> thing I, I expected to have during this conversation. But <laughs> it's tough, because I'll tell you what, my, my parents were adamant that I graduated with honors and so on and so forth. They wouldn't let me test out of school, which I commend them for. I definitely had that argument a few times. Well, why don't you just let me test out? I can yeah. easily and then I don't have to deal with it. But they wouldn't let me do that. So they enrolled me in a in an accredited homeschooling institution for let's say like child actors and just kids yeah. who are, you know, starting their careers at, at such young ages. But what really worked well for me is that I was pretty much my own teacher. I was given textbooks and the curriculum and I was in charge of completing the work and sending it to my teachers. I had teachers who I could email or get on the phone with if I had any questions, if I was stumped. But because I was given all the coursework and I was in charge of the scheduling, I was able to tackle one subject at a time. So oh. rather than pieces of each class a day, I would do one week of school in a given subject and then finish the whole subject in about two weeks. Oh, that's interesting. So I really appreciated that because you retain the information better. Yeah. And you also are able to learn everything you need to learn and then you do your final. Mm -hmm. What everyone's used to, which I was used to as well. Yeah. In before homeschooling, which was you do bits and pieces of everything. And then when it comes to the final, you think, God, I have to remember everything that I've already forgotten from earlier in the year. I get it done and I got it done in a two, two and a half week stretch. And that it was, was it. right there. Yeah. But you are, let me compliment you for a second. One of the most disciplined humans I have ever met on the planet. Like, well, I don't think there's ever a moment where you're not busy doing something. So when you're that disciplined and as talented as you are, how do you survive quarantine? Like, what do you do? That's what makes quarantine easy for me is that I always have something that I want <laughs> to do. And I have to say, I feel terrible. I feel slightly guilty in, in regards to how easy isolation is for me. And I feel uh -huh. bad for people who go through crazy and get cabin fever and, and just love being outside and doing things. But I was built for staying indoors and just keeping myself entertained. I mean, I have all my instruments with me with the exception of a real acoustic drum set, but I'm surrounded by music and toys and, and this is a great, I mean, you and I were talking about um, books the other day. So it's vampire books. <laughs> in your brain, because I remember um, I saw you in Minnesota, we were talking about, or Minneapolis, we were talking about vampire books. Mm -hmm. which and I've made more of an effort during quarantine to read more fiction because I'm usually reading history books and stuff that people would find boring and dry. But, but I love that about you, that you get so into history. See, nobody knows that other than us because we talk every once in a while. Like, what's the latest history book that you've read that you loved, biography-wise? Latest history book was um, recommended to me by my girlfriend's mother because she knows I'm a huge to 
uh, I don't know if fan is the right word, but I'm fascinated by it. And she recommended this biography of a woman named Nancy Wake, who was an mm -hmm. Australian lady who ended up moving to Europe and was caught up in World War II and ended up being... You love World War II novels. I do, I do. And she ended up being kind of a resistance fighter. And she was one of the most decorated people of the entire war. Most people don't know about her, but her name's Nancy Wake. And a woman, I love that. Yeah, it was great. Really What's good. What's her name again? Nancy Wake. I love it. So, okay, you're reading in quarantine. You love it. You might be slightly an introvert. That's fine. Um, well, you know what you may find funny is that the first book I read dealing with history during quarantine was about the Black Plague. I'm like, you know what? This seems fitting. Sure. Well, let's read about plagues. Why not? Well, bring it full circle. And then the next one was I Am Legend, so vampires. So it's all, <laughs> all coming around. That's awesome. Um, but are you actually making new music in quarantine? I know you have some sort of setup, right? I spilled my coffee all over myself. This is all your fault. Um, I'm so sorry. Did you burn yourself? No, I didn't burn myself. I'm just kind of upset with myself. I think I got <laughs> I'm so sorry. Fault. I'm just joking. Um, what was that? Sorry. Um, no, you have a setup, right? To record music if you wanted to while you're home. So have you been recording at all? I've been recording a lot, and a lot of it has been the new Angels and Airwaves album. There have been a lot of files going back and forth uh, between Tom, my brother Aaron, and myself. My brother Aaron, who manages me and does all the new regime stuff, has also been engineering and producing all the Angels stuff for a good while now. But that's been the, the priority right now. I mean, there was a lot of time where Tom was working on everything in San Diego, I'm up in LA. And obviously with things being locked down, what we're doing is just emails going back and forth daily with whatever's being worked on. Yeah. So does that mean heart, mind, body and soul from New Regime is kind of on the back burner compared to the Angels and Airwaves stuff you're working on right now? No, I mean, Heart, Mind, Body and Soul is already out. I mean, unfortunately it came out just as the world ended. Right, you were on tour about to like present it to everyone and- Exactly. Yeah, but um, definitely not on the back burner. In fact, I'm doing a lot of sort of live FaceTime session, live stream type things uh, with the new regime material, which has been good. I'm going to be doing yeah. for, um, Rolling Stone Mexico later today, which should be fun. I mean, I was supposed to be there doing some festivals next which month. Which festivals were supposed to happen this weekend? Uh, not this weekend, uh, next month. Uh, it was the Corona Capital in Guadalajara. Oh, sure. That's yeah. a big festival. Really looking forward to that. But uh, it was canceled. Oh. This this thing with, uh, sorry, I'm moving everything around. This coffee. It's fine. You spilled coffee. I mean, we're just having a day. It's fine. It's quarantine. Oh, it's rough. It's rough. But yeah, that was one of the, the things I was looking forward to. But as you know, I mean, I'm sure you've had people do kind of live sessions. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. been doing those. That's but, cool. We're actually doing um, a faux festival on Go 96.3 this weekend because nobody can go to festivals. So we're yeah. actually having our listeners vote on what bands they'd want to play this hypothetical festival that's only going to air on the radio. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh -huh. Just, you know, to pretend. Uh -huh. Okay. Angels and Airwaves is probably going to be on the bill, just so you know. So you can maybe play the new song, All That's Left Is Love. Okay. Right? That's going to a good cause, isn't it? Yes, it is. What's going on with that? Tom would really be the person to ask about those details, but okay. know that it is going to a good cause, any sales of that. So yeah, I just don't want to give out any incorrect. I get that. I get that. Totally. Because Sorry for the noises in the background. My dog is like having a good one going after a bone right now. How's Bubba doing? He's great. He has a little bit um, more meltdowns than usual in quarantine, probably because mm. he feels like he's getting ignored more. Like mm. he's right here. Can you see him? Bubs, say no, hi. I there he he's is. Like, he's right there, like craving attention all the time. How's your pup? She's great. She's, uh, I want to say she's crazy. I can't tell if it's too crazy or if it's just puppy. It's probably puppy because she's about seven months old, but she, yeah. she needs an outlet for the energy and, um, it's almost superhuman. Yeah. So it's difficult to, to deal with sometimes, but she's either asleep or she's nuts, but well. whatever. I mean, at least you're not busy in quarantine, so you have time to chase a dog around, right? Exactly, I guess. But Sam, my girlfriend, does most of the, yeah. the pulling around with her. Well, that's awesome. So 
as far as um supporting musicians at this time like people in your situation obviously you're in a fortunate place you're in many bands so you have a lot of different streams of money coming in and what you're doing with the all that is left is love you know that's going to a good cause but to help musicians that maybe aren't in as fortunate of a place what do you think the best way is to to help them and get the money at this time since they can't tour that tough one i mean i know there are some platforms that are built for kind of monetizing these live stream events which okay. that could be something i know there's some um, there's some government help that is available to people who have been affected. i didn't know that okay there is some stuff i mean i couldn't give you the details but it is something worth looking up mm -hmm. um I, people in the gig are of are capable of getting some assistance i mean that's something to definitely look into yeah and it depends. I mean, there are always ways of doing something. I don't really know. I'm not, I'm not in a- Yeah, well, I've heard that merch helps. Would you say that that's true? Merch does help, but uh, I guess it's hard to say because, you know, the, the mind would go to selling stuff, but everyone's been hit economically. So- Yeah. I would say, please do that for whoever is selling. It. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the new Angels and Airwaves music that you're working on, when do you think that that stuff's going to come out for everybody to enjoy? I don't know. And I only say that because I don't feel comfortable giving any sort of dates out. Okay. What's happening. We're, most of it is done. And... How I'm do you do that remotely, though? Do you lay down the drum track first and then he comes in and does his part? Uh, no, I mean, he he writes in San Diego, then sends me the stuff. I have an electronic drum set over here that's hooked up via MIDI to the computer so that oh, the drum cool. quality samples. And I don't think most people would notice, but we are obviously going to re-record it properly with real drums. And um, that's pretty much how the writing has been going. So we've gotten everything to a point where all we really need to do is re-record everything properly, which you know, wouldn't take long, but I don't even know if studios are open at the moment. I don't know where we would do it because I'm in LA and he's in San Diego. So there's some, some coordinating that would need to take. Place Logistical is, things. Exactly. And that kind of at the, uh, at the will of whatever the current policies are in terms of mm -hmm. and all that fun stuff. So I really don't know. Okay. What about Nine Inch Nails though? What's going on with that camp? That is, I mean, aside from the Hall of Fame, whenever that is being rescheduled, has been rescheduled. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of at the moment. But uh, I certainly hope there's more. I just don't think, I don't think anything, anything will be planned in, until everything's kind of back on track. Yeah. Do you hear my dog in the background chewing a bone right now? No, I do. have a meltdown. Mm. Uh, I'm going to take like a few questions. People have dropped down here in the questions section. So let's see what they asked you. Um, let's see. Fact, How gonna... do you play all of the instruments at the high level that you do? Um, it begins with not having a life. <laughs> um, I mean, look, I, I'm not going to deny that I naturally picked up music. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that everything has come easily to me, but fortunately I had that sort of obsessive drive with mm -hmm. getting better and learning things. So, I mean, I certainly put in the time, but um, I also did take advantage of the, the natural talent that I had, but I put a lot of time into improving. How much do you practice each day? I don't have a set uh, schedule or routine. I've always found that, I mean, I commend the people who rehearse in prison hours and hours. You okay? Yeah. I commend the people who, who do that, but I've always found that it's more beneficial to just take advantage of the inspiration while you have it. Yeah. So I'd play for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, then I'd get up and go do something else. And then I'd get that spark of inspiration to go play again. And I'd go do it for another 20 minutes. So. But like I said, the people who sit there for hours and hours and hours, I mean, good for them. That was just, <laughs> that was never my style. 
Well, what's your favorite song to play? Oh, I don't have one. I don't have a favorite song to play. That would mean that I would dislike the rest of them. But um, do you get into phases though, and like continually play certain songs for like a week at a time? Um. Ah. When you say songs, are you talking about bands that I play with or just in general? It could be in general. Someone in here asked what's your favorite song to play with Angels and Airways, but I think in general is also a fair question. Uh -huh. Okay, let me try to knock out the Angels and Airwaves question. I have to kind of go back to whatever the set list was the last time we were out. It's a bit of a blur to me right now. Uh, Paralyze is a, is a really fun one to play got a good groove to it i mean most of the a lot of the angels and airwaves stuff is up tempo and that's very fun to play but because of that in terms of drumming there's a bit of a similar thread through it and mm -hmm. i feel that something like paralyze a bit more groove based and i think quite a, a bit of the high harmonies live i uh really enjoy playing that one so that one sticks out to me at home it could be anything i mean i was i'm always learning other people's songs. I mean, love singing to a variety of those. So, um, yeah, I'll have it Do you have, do you have a favorite Beatles song? I don't. There are too many good ones to pick a favorite. It's just impossible. Have you ever tried recording that way to a four track and then mastering it and then recording again? When you say mastering, are you talking about bouncing? <laughs> Well, right, wasn't it how they did it to a four track, mixed it down, then recorded three more tracks, mixed it down, then, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't tried to do it as an exercise, which I've actually been interested in because I have a couple of some shitty four track cassette players or recorders from the- Quarantine the project. Yeah, so those are fun, but I still, I mean, even these days, you still have to bounce down just because it becomes easier to keep track of things. So for example, I love to stack vocals and I'll often do, let's say I have a four part harmony and I want it to sound like a nice big choir. I'll record each note four times. So that gives us 16 tracks. So when it, once I've gotten the balance, I like bouncing those down to just a single track so I don't have to deal with 16 individuals. Do you use Pro Tools to do that or what do you use? I, I do, I use Pro Tools. I know there are a lot of people who hate it a lot of people who love it, but I am a, a Pro Tools user myself. I like that about you. Let me grab another question here from your fans. Go for um, it. What's your favorite guitar brand? Oof. It's hard to sum it down to just one, but I love Fender and Gibson. Those are, those are it. Love them. How many Fenders and how many Gibsons do you have? Too many to count. <laughs> it's a real problem. Uh, I mean, I probably have upwards of about 25 guitars, and most of them are split down the middle between Fender and Gibson. But you'd rather be playing the drums? Depends on what I'm doing. I mean, I love the drums, but they're not, uh, they're not a melodic instrument. You can't do any harmonies with them. You don't really write songs with them. So they have their time and place. I was saying before you joined the live, don't hate me for saying this, but I kind of think this just as a, a friend and fan from the outside, mm -hmm. that you're always busy and working with people kind of like Travis Barker always is. Uh -huh. uh, he's always working and recording with other artists. Have you ever considered going down that path of working um, with hip hop artists as he has? I mean, the huge difference there is that he's a massive fan of that style of music. I'm fairly, I'm extremely ignorant to it. And I'm just mm -hmm. being honest. I yeah, that's fine. For especially studio stuff, I, I play drums for whoever liked my playing and wanted wanted my style on, on their stuff. But I know that he actively seeks it out. He's right. Like, big fan, you know? Have you ever considered, since you are actually classically trained on certain instruments, making a classical music album or piano album? Um, I'm, I've, I've spent a lot of time, even before, pretty much since the end of last year, I've spent a lot of time studying scoring and orchestral music. And I mean, it's something that I've always enjoyed, but I've really gotten into it um, this 
past. So, so definitely something that I would like to get into. But the thing is that the bar has been set so high by people hundreds of years ago that <laughs> can compete with, you know, not that Do that's you ever the think about how crazy it is, right? If you're Bach or Beethoven or whatever. Two great choices, by the way. Um, but nobody ever heard the versions of the way they would play the songs because recordings didn't exist then. So we have an idea of what the songs sound like, but there's actually, unless you saw it live back in the day, yeah, nobody's it, alive on this planet unless vampires exist. Have say, say they saw it, you know, like that's a wild thing. Whereas now, at least you can create music and it will exist for future generations, for aliens, for whoever finds it. Yeah, it, it's a crazy thing, especially when I'm gonna geek out on you for a second. So in Bach, which is the Baroque era, which is mm -hmm. try to define it in time, anywhere from 1600 to 1750. He was born in 1685 and his I death, love when you geek out, this is my favorite. Can you tell? Keep going. His death in 1750 pretty much marks the end of the period, but it was very much the style then to improvise, which we don't really associate with classical music these days. It's very much the note on the page is what is played. And I don't know why or when imp uh, improvisation kind of fell out of favor. But what's crazy is that we know the music as it's written on the page, whereas what he would have played live at a performance could have been very different. So almost like the notation was treated as a roadmap. Mm -hmm. And the, the part of the skill of being a great musician then was to improvise. So that's an interesting thing to think about. I like it. Mm. Someone just dropped below. This is a good question. Uh, what's your favorite amp? favorite amp i don't have one it's you can't do that um i love vox amps i love fender amps i love marshall amps i love tone amps i love there's just so many good amps and not only that i even like where the technology has gone with amp modeling i mean i, I would i wouldn't prefer it to real amps but there's just there's so many good things out there mm -hmm. and yeah. what is your issue with amp modeling as it is well, nothing really beats, it's not just the sound, there's an actual feel when you play a real amplifier. And that as of now has not been replicated entirely accurately. It's gotten to the point where one could listen to an amp model and not know that it's not a real amplifier, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like as good as electronic drums may get or digital pianos might get it's never going to replace the real thing yeah do you have a favorite piece of equipment that you always have to take with you when you go on tour um or plug in or pedal no not really not really things always change have you ever used a non-traditional instrument in recording a song um i've done perhaps uh non-traditional things but i haven't used you know some bizarre instrument that we've never heard of i haven't done anything like that yet yeah yeah well people love you in here and they keep asking questions about drummers that you're into or up and coming drummers or if there's any of those other little kid drummers that you're a fan of right now that you I mean, see on social media anytime i see a um a really young drummer especially i mean obviously them doing led zeppelin songs is something that gets people's attention so i always appreciate that i mean a lot of those kids um I, are this, the age that i was when i was playing and obsessing over that same thing and even younger in a lot of cases but i always enjoy that but um in terms of what else is going on you know me i kind of have my head in a hole in the ground not out of really wanting to be that way i'm just always focused on something so my my ability to discover other things is kind of hampered, unfortunately, but yeah. hopefully I can fix that one day. And I know people are coming in and out of this live, so we kind of talked about this before, but we have no idea when touring's gonna happen again, but a lot of people are wondering if you think you're gonna be touring once this is over with Nine Inch Nails or with Angels and Airwaves. Do I? I mean, yeah. absolutely, yeah. I just don't know when, and the new regime for that matter. But um, like I said, I, I have a hard time 
even thinking about scheduling because you never know what's going to happen. Hopefully everything improves quicker than, than estimated, but you never know. And what show are you binge watching right now, if any? Ooh, what did I just finish? I just finished uh, watching the BBC Sherlock series with Benedict sure. Cumberbatch. Good. Um, I haven't necessarily started something, although I was turned on to Killing Eve yesterday. I watched the first episode. And okay. that's good, like some good old spy stuff. Sure. So, hey, get into that. Uh, but we'll see. Okay. Is there any final parting thoughts before we finish up our coffee chat? Um, next time we do this, I'm going to get like a tumbler with a lid so I don't spend half the time cleaning up the mess I made. It's fine. I'm going to figure out how to sedate my dog so he's not so loud in the background and having a <laughs> meltdown. Oh, don't but worry. Here, here we are, though, doing the things from our places. I like your bookshelves, by the way. Thank you. There's books in them and records. Very nice. I'm sure, just like yours. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you. Well, thank you for coming in. My Have pleasure. a little coffee chat with us and definitely keep us posted on all the new stuff to come that you've been working on. Absolutely. Okay, we'll all talk right. to you soon. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.